the word will bring about internal transformation and change and lord we are careful always to give you the praise the honor and the glory in jesus name amen you may have your seats this morning turn to your neighbor and say it's good to see you in the house of the lord and we are in the month of october and this is the month where you see that there is a widespread prevalence and acceptance of the ancient festival of Halloween and other occultic practices. So much so that the month of October has become associated with darkness and the occult. Many countries, many companies, and I want you to be on the lookout. They design marketing campaigns around these occultic themes to generate increased traffic to their businesses and to increase sales of their products. Unknowingly, even the church has been caught in this web of deception and compromise with many reaping the consequences of their ill-advised actions. And that is why we are from this pulpit combating this deception and darkness. We are starting a new series of messages beginning today on the theme Piercing the Darkness. And I will be sharing on that theme over the next four weeks piercing the darkness and i have one thing i want to ask of you i do not want to see any empty chairs so i'm encouraging you bring your friends and your family we want to see this entire auditorium this sanctuary packed out there are some important truths we will be sharing over the next four weeks Amen? That you, your families, your friends, they need to hear. In fact, what we are doing, we are going to be having a special prize for the person who brings out the most visitors. And I want to ask Sister Carol if she could keep check, check on that for us this morning. And over the next four weeks, the person who brings out the most visitors, you are going to get a special prize at the end of the month. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 60. We're reading two verses, verse 2 and 3. This is going to be our main text for the next four weeks. We are going to be looking at other scriptures, but this is the main text that we will be using over these four weeks. So let's follow in our Bibles. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. You all notice what the writer is saying? Darkness is going to cover the earth, and deep darkness will cover the people. There are many people, some of them your family, some of them your friends, they are covered in deep darkness. What happens to people who are covered in darkness? You can't see. You're bumping into this. You're bumping into that. You're going to end up in a ditch. Because you can't see where you're going. And spiritually, there are a lot of people that we interact with. They are in deep darkness. They are heading for a Christless eternity. You see how serious this is? The writer, he goes on, he says, But the Lord, somebody say, but the Lord, will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. 
to our hearing. May he open up our eyes to see his light which has come to pierce the darkness. And thousands of years ago, the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied about a time when this darkness is going to cover the earth and deep darkness will cover the people. Let's control the noise there, please. Hallelujah. I believe we are now living in the days of that darkness that Isaiah warned us about. It has arrived. You say, what evidence do you have to support that claim? When you survey the world, you have to be blind not to see that the world is filled with all forms of darkness and evil. I will go so far as to say that I believe we are living in the darkest days that we have seen in human history. Let me give you some evidence. When there is widespread acceptance, widespread acceptance of laws condemning millions of babies to death, even before they exit their mother's womb, all because someone says they are inconvenient. When you have laws, I said, condoning that, then that is a darkness that we have not seen before. When you have churches, note what I say, when you have churches embracing the gay lifestyle as a legitimate alternative to heterosexual in intimacy as enshrined in the scriptures because the bible i know it says a man let, uh, let a man be joined to his wife and the two shall be one flesh it never said a man and another man in fact, you could read Romans 1 where God repudiates that. It was an abomination unto God. That's why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. It repels God. It, 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 it brings up a, a stench in God's nostrils. He calls it an abomination. And you have churches that are accepting that lifestyle to the point of ordaining gay ministers. And not just ordaining gay ministers, but marrying gay couples. I'm saying, that is a darkness that we have not seen before. When you have widespread acceptance of the occult, magic, witchcraft, through the proliferation and the culture, you go into some of these stores and you see them venerating Halloween, trick or treat. And even the church is into that foolishness. I'm saying when you begin to see that happening, that is a darkness that we have not seen before. You see it in the movies. They have so, and you check it out. Check out the movies that are being released in the month of October. All of them have that theme of darkness. That is, that, is, that, is, that is holding on to the minds of the young people. Deception. Telling them that there is good magic and there is there's, there's white magic and black magic. All magic is bad. It has no white magic and black magic. All is darkness. All is abominable before the Lord. You want to have no right getting involved in those things. Movies like Harry Potter and all of these movies. Generating billions of dollars. When you have the psychic movement. A multi-billion dollar industry. You know what spirit is behind? Are we going to be talking about that? You know what spirit is behind the psychic movement? It's a spirit of divination. That python spirit that wraps itself around you and squeezes the life out of you. That is what is controlling the psychic movement. 
the spirit of divination. Paul and the others, they encountered a girl who was possessed by that spirit of divination that brought in her masters lots of money. And she was going around following Paul and Silas and the others saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. Paul got annoyed. One day he got annoyed. He says, Come out of her! The demon had no choice but to exit. And that crooked enterprise fell flat. But there is a spirit of divination that has wrapped its tentacles around the world. So much so now, you could call. You could go on the World Wide Web. You check out the papers. They have psychics all over the place. Spirit of divination. Anytime you get involved with that, you're opening up a door that you have no right opening up. You are inviting the python spirit to come in and wrap its tentacles around your family. We'll wreak havoc. So I'm saying, when you begin to see that, you know, we're in a darkness that we have never seen before. Do you know that there are satanic churches that have, uh, that have a legal right to exist? Satanic churches worshipping Lucifer. But you talk about Jesus, they want to throw you in jail. They want to persecute you. You can't use that name, but you could use the name of Lucifer. I'm saying when you begin to see that, you know we're in a darkness that we have not seen before. Even inside the church, and this is a whole new series by itself, even inside the church, the so-called charismatic churches, they are seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There are many ministers so-called big hefes they are involved in secret societies and the occult to get occultic powers they use all sorts of charms and rituals you see them using water and special oil sometimes they so they so brazen they will print the palm on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a sheet or something and say, when you put your hand in my hand, the power is going to flow. Demonic. Demonic stuff. And I'm saying, when you begin to see all of that, you know that we, have seen a, that we are in a darkness that we have not seen before. The world has become so dark that many no longer see the light. That's why Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's what they're doing today. They're calling evil good and good evil. He says, Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There is a day of judgment coming for those who fail to repent of their dark deeds. For those who fail to return to the light, there is a day of judgment coming. And unfortunately, many have become so depraved that they are willing to choose darkness over light. Many of these popular musicians and music artists and i am sure if i call a few of their names you will know them many of them they have literally sold their soul to the devil they are devil worshipers you want to ensure that you do not listen to their music do not listen to their music it's demonically inspired A lot of these popular young artists, you see their concerts, thousands of people hooked in bondage. And Paul the Apostle, he said, one of the major signs that will mark the last days 
is the manifestation of darkness in the hearts of men. Jesus also said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. What happened in the days of Noah? The, the Bible says there was widespread corruption and evil where the very thoughts of man was only on evil. We are seeing a return of those days right here and now. And so you ask the question, how do we overcome? How do we as born again believers, children of the light, how do we pierce the darkness that is covering the earth. What advice can we glean from the word of God? Our text says that the glory of the Lord will rise upon us. And be seen on us. Because it's the glory that attracts. Light always attracts. But that is what God does. He provides the light. He provides his presence. He provides his glory. But what about you? What is required of you to pierce the darkness? Well, let's hear what Jesus had to say about this. Luke chapter 11, verse 33 to 36. Listen to what Jesus had to say about light and darkness. He says, no one... When he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand. I want you to take note. If current gone and you have to pull out your candle <laughs> and them long time kerosene lamp, where are you going to put that? In a corner under your bed? No, where are you putting it? You're putting that in the middle of the room on your table, or some prominent location. You're going to put it where it can shine. You're going to put it under your bed. You're going to put it inside, you know, your closet. Oh, you're not doing that. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, you ain't going to put it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand. That those who come in may see the light. Then he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. The lamp of your body is the eye. That's, a, that's such a profound statement. We're going to get into that. He says, therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. You notice what Jesus said? Take heed. In other words, don't be deceived. Don't mistake light for darkness. He says, if then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. And so, in this passage, Jesus was giving us a discourse on the importance of light. And the practicality of putting light in the correct place. You see, he's wanting to have light. But that light needs to be in the right place for it to be effective. And so as we digest these words, there are three nuggets I, wanted, I want us to take away from these words of Jesus. That will enable us to pierce the darkness pierce the darkness penetrate the darkness that surrounds us and the first of these is this to pierce the darkness we must position ourselves in the midst of the darkness to transform it if you want to pierce the darkness you are light you can't be in a corner somewhere Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You didn't know? You are the light of the world. He says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And in these verses, he says, no one 
takes a lamp and put it in some corner somewhere, under some basket somewhere. No! He says to do that would be foolish. Because light was not meant to be hidden, but to be positioned in a prominent place so that it could shine forth its light. And Jesus is saying in the same way, you are light. And because you are light, you cannot be hid. You cannot be covered in some place. You must be positioned in a prominent place so that you could pierce the darkness. So your position is important. If you claim to be a born again Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you don't want anybody to know, you want to be concealed, hiding in some corner there. You know, we call that the what? The closet Christian. You walk in and nobody know you are Christian and you comfortable with that. Then you have reason to question, are you truly born again? Because when the light of Christ has truly captured your heart, something inside of you is going to rise up that cannot be restrained, that cannot be contained, that cannot be silenced. The very character and DNA of Christ will burst forth through you. And so I'm saying, you cannot say that you are Christian and you don't want nobody to know. Then you have to question that. You have to question that. When Jesus came into the world, did he go and hide away in some corner? No, he says, I must go to all these towns and cities. He was going everywhere, doing good. And if we are Christians, followers of Christ, we must do what he did. If you are not doing what he is doing and what he did, then are you truly a follower of Christ? You see, when Christ has captured your heart, there's something that will propel you to go out into the midst of the darkness. Because that is where you have the greatest impact. As a light bearer, you were meant to be placed in the midst of the darkness. You were meant to be placed where people are groping in darkness. And so I, I say to you this morning, take no satisfaction in your Christian service unless and until you make it your business to embed yourself in the midst of the darkness. You say, what does that look like? It looks like this. Going to your friends and your family who are lost, who are covered in deep darkness. It looks like you going to them and sharing the light of Christ Telling them that there's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. That Jesus Christ is the only way Amen. to salvation. Amen. Because today is the day of repentance. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised. And there can be no repentance in the grave. After you die, the Bible says, It is appointed unto man wants to die and after death the judgment you can't repent after you die you have to repent now and so today is all we have nobody knows what tomorrow holds and so i am challenged this is a challenging word eh? this is a challenge this is not some cotton candy message a feel-good message. We don't preach feel-good messages here. We are here to challenge you. We are here to help you fulfill your purpose and destiny in God. So that when you stand before him, you will hear him say, Well done! Good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. 
You have to make your calling and election sure. We are not saved. And I want to say this here. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works. But because you are saved, you will do the works. The works demonstrates who you belong to. The works in themselves is not going to save you. It's by grace through faith. So we're not working for our salvation. But I tell you this. The Bible says God is a righteous judge. There will be a performance appraisal. There will be rewards. And he says, some will, will, will you know, when he gave the different talents and abilities, some will produce a hundredfold, some fifty, some so on and so forth. And there will be rewards. He says, to those who, you know, um, produce a hundredfold, he says, you come and rule over ten cities. You rule over five cities. And then there will be some who will lose their reward, but they will be saved, but they will lose their reward. You know why? Because they did not take the words of the Lord seriously. And the Lord is going to show them, these are all the opportunities I gave you. You had the same opportunities he had, she had. What did you do with your opportunities? But there's a second nugget we can take away from this text. That can help us pierce the darkness. And it's this. To pierce the darkness... You have to protect your eyes from becoming tainted by the darkness. You see, you are in the darkness. You are in the darkness. You are in the midst of the darkness. And so you have to protect your eyes from being tainted by the darkness. You see, Jesus says, although we are in the world, we are not of the world. So you have to remain insulated from the effects of the darkness that pervades us. You say, is that even possible? Well, Jesus thinks so. That's why he said in verse 34 to 36, listen to what he said. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. He says, therefore, take heed. Take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. He says, if then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? So let me break this down. In the same way that you, the born again believer, remember we read in Isaiah, deep darkness covering the people and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you and so on and so forth and the Gentiles will be attracted to your light. So Jesus is saying in the same way that you are light to a darkened world, he says, your eye is the light to the rest of your body. So he's comparing us now to the eye. And the same effect that you have on the darkened world is the same effect that your eye is going to have on you as an individual. In other words, the same way that you transmit the light of God to the world... Your eye transmit light to your body. And that's why Jesus says, if your eye is good or full of light, then your body will also be full of light. Because it is receiving light from the eye. Conversely, if your eye is bad or full of darkness, then your body would also be full of darkness. Why? Because your eye 
is a gate to the rest of your body. That's the thing that Jesus is telling us here. Your eye is a gateway. What does a gateway do? It provides access. It allows things to enter and exit. And so Jesus is saying, your eye is a gateway that allows light or darkness to enter your body. You see it now? So the point is, whatever passes through the gate of your eyes will enter the body. So the eye then is crucial because it determines whether you are going to be full of light or full of darkness. Now you understand why I say you have to protect your eyes. And that is one of our primary responsibilities as believers. You have to protect the eye gate. Because what you allow to pass through those gates will influence your life and will ultimately determine your destiny, whether for good or for evil. That's why Jesus says, take heed that the light that is in you doesn't turn to darkness. In other words, don't allow yourself to be deceived. For what a man sows, that is what he's going to reap. If you are sowing darkness and allowing all manner of filth to enter the eye gate, then know for certain that the light that you think that you have inside of you will be turned to darkness and you wouldn't even know it. You'd be full of darkness and deceived. This is exactly what happened to Samson. Remember? My partner going down to the, to the Philistines. You know why he went down? Because of his eyes. You see them Philistine women, boy. Ah, boy. How they get one? How they get one of them, boy? He going down. He playing with fire. <laughs> he, don't, he don't even know he playing with fire. Uh -huh. Well, he hook up with a, with, with, a, with a lady called what? Delilah. The head of the fire. <laughs> that was the, the fire lady herself. <laughs> he gone messing with Delilah when he had no business messing with Delilah. And Delilah trying she best boy. Tell me a secret now. Nah. Tell me a secret. Tell me a secret. About three, three, three wrongs at that game they play. And every time you know. That um, Samson would tell us something. and Oh Samson. The Philistines are upon you. Brah, break, break loose and beat them up. And Delilah said. But you's a real set up man. Why are you treating me like this? Eh? You're lying to me. And the Bible says that she went at him day and night until she break him down. And finally he said, alright, the secret of my power is in my hair. Uh -huh, who tell him do that? She put him to sleep. And while your boy is sleeping, <laughs> snoring, <laughs> eh? she cut off all his hair. So the light that he thought he had, it turned to darkness. He didn't even know. So she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. My partner, get up. He said, but wait now. <laughs> I still bong. I can't, I can't break loose. The Bible says he got up as he were, as, as the, in times past, but he didn't know that the Spirit of God had left him. You know what they did to Mr. Samson? You know which part of him they went for? They ain't go for his big muscles either, but he didn't have big muscles. They ain't try to cut off his head. You know what they do? They gouge out his eyes. Couldn't see. What is the moral of this story? Your eyes will either lead you to destruction or it will lead you to glory. What are you allowing to come through the eye gate? Jesus says, take heed. Because what you allow will either cause you to be full of light 
or full of darkness as born again believers the only way you could pierce that darkness is by protecting your eyes what are you allowing yourself to watch what are you allowing yourself to see you can't play with fire and then get burned ask samson uh, ask samson can't play with fire and don't get burned protect your eye gate the eyes are the window to the soul And I want to say to you that the quality of light that you have inside of you right now is not based on your past deeds, your past decision. It's not based on, you know, what you did in the past. It's based on what you are doing now. It is based on your current walk and relationship with the Lord. That's why the Lord says, the one who will be saved is the one who perseveres and endures to what? The end. You could start off good. Start off in a blaze of glory. I always tell you all about the story in the 1988 or the 1992 Olympics with, with um, Eon Morris. Eon Morris was on his way to a bronze medal. I mean, back at that time, that was a big thing. All of Trinidad and Tobago was glued. And just before Ian Morris hit the finish line, I don't know what demon get inside that Ian Morris said. He decided to, to do that. And as he do that, in that split second, Samson Keto, he do that. And edged him out of a bronze medal. The quality of your relationship with the Lord is based, or the quality of the light that is in you is based on the currency of your walk with the Lord now. What are you doing now? When you stand before the Lord, He ain't going to ask you what you did 10 years ago, you know. What are you doing now? Where are you at now? You have to persevere in the faith because faith is always no, no faith. No, in the present tense. Jesus wants to know what is the quality of your faith. No, not last year. You can't go and tell God, well, you know, I used to be on fire for the Lord. I used to do all of this. I used to climb this mountain and do that and go and feed the poor. What are you doing? No, that's what the Lord wants to know. Are you still in the faith? Are you protecting your eyes? What is the quality of the light that is in you? No! Not 10 years ago. No! Because it's possible to fall away. It's possible to drift. It's possible to stray. And so, that's why you have to persevere to the end. He that perseveres to the end, that's the man that's going to be saved. Not the man who start off in a blaze of glory. Start off well. It's such a sad thing to see all these ministers fall in. Just within the last couple of years, look at how many ministers fall in. Many of them started off well, you know. Where are they now? What are they doing now? You have to stay current in your walk with the Lord. That's why the priests in the Old Testament times you know what was one of the main requirements of the priests? They had to keep that lamp burning in the temple. They couldn't allow that lamp to go out. They wouldn't take God out of their thoughts to let that lamp go out. Because that place had to be filled with light. To have that lamp go out would have been offensive to God. And so maintaining that perpetual light in the temple is really a prophetic picture of what is required in the life of a believer. You have to maintain the light. You didn't provide the light, but you have to maintain that light. You can't afford to allow the light that is in you to turn to darkness. And this is where the protection of the eyes are crucial. 
Because if you allow darkness and filth to come in, it's going to cause the light that is in you to be turned to darkness. You have to protect your eyes. Keep them from being tainted by the darkness that surrounds you. Because when your eyes are good, your body will be full of the light of Christ. But when they are bad, they will be filled with the darkness of the world. But there is a third and final point from Jesus' discourse that we need to incorporate in our arsenal. If we are going to pierce the darkness. You say, what is that? To pierce the darkness, we must prioritize those things that please God over the things that please man. You have to make a priority. You have to make God your priority. We have too many men pleasers in the church today and not enough God pleasers. As Jesus continued to talk about the light and how believers ought to leverage this light to dispel darkness, there was a Pharisee who invited him to dinner. So as Jesus went into the Pharisee's house, he sat down, he didn't wash his hands, and he started to eat. The Pharisee could not believe what he was seeing. He said, but isn't this man a prophet? Isn't this a man of God? And he didn't wash his hands? He couldn't believe what we are seeing. Because in the mind of a Pharisee, to do such a thing was considered sacrilegious. Because it violated their man-made traditions and customs. How dare him come to my home and not wash his hands? You are disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably what was going through the mind of the Pharisee. He was having a, a fit in his mind and knowing his thoughts and the confusion in his darkened mind. Listen to what Jesus said to him. Jesus said to him, you Pharisees, you religious elites, you make the outside of the cup and the dish clean. And clean. Clean. The outside of the cup clean sparkling clean but he says your inward part is full of greed and wickedness foolish ones jesus says he says did not he who made the outside make the inside also when the pharisee heard that he was he was dumbfounded he was speechless he couldn't answer why because he was in darkness and he didn't even know it and you know what is sad about this incident? Is the fact that not much has changed today. There are many people who have religion and a form of godliness just like this Pharisee. But they continue to grope in darkness. Why? Because they have prioritized the traditions of men over the word of God. Making the word of God of no effect in their lives. And so their darkness remains. This was the predicament of the Pharisee. He was covered in such great darkness that he could not see that he had mistakenly elevated the traditions of men above the things of God. And it may have appeared that Jesus was being harsh. I mean, Jesus had some choice words for the Pharisees, eh? He called them, you brood of vipers, you empty clouds, you white wall sepulchers. I mean, you, if you were listening to Jesus, you would say, but Jesus, eh, easy boy. You know why Jesus did that? Drastic situations require drastic actions. This man was in, so steeped in darkness. He was headed for a ditch where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus had to use extreme measures to jolt him. 
and arrest him from this slippery slide into perdition. Now you understand why Jesus said in verse 42 of Luke 11, he says, Woe to you Pharisees! You tied mint and rue and all manner of herbs. Them fellas take tithing to the point where they tied in down to a leaf, a clover. If you give them ten cloves, they're going and tied one of them cloves. That is to tell you the extent of the tithing. Jesus said, you fellas, you tied in mint and rue and all manner of cloves. And here what you're doing now, you're passing by things like justice and the love of God. He says, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, what he's saying, you're prioritizing the wrong thing, Pharisee. You telling me about washing hands? And Jesus in another place, he said to them, you know, um, what you put in doesn't make you unclean because it comes through the draft. He says, uncleanness comes from inside the heart. That's why it says God looks at the internal heart positions of men. We will get tied up looking at the outer, outer adorning. But God looks at the heart. He wants to see what is coming out of your heart. And you see, when your eye is bad, and you're allowing all kind of darkness to come through, your heart is going to be bad. So Jesus is saying, you have it wrong side, Pharisee. You have it back to front. What are you telling me about washing hands? That is not going to make me unclean. What makes a man unclean is what comes out of his heart. He says, you have your priorities wrong side. And you know, so Jesus, he offends the mind to win the heart. That's why he was so harsh with the words. He offends the mind to win the heart. That's why he was rebuking them so harshly. Because he wanted to capture their heart. They had things back to front. They prioritized their traditions up here and the word of God down there. But only when the word of God occupies first place in your heart... Are you going to be empowered to pierce the darkness? Jesus says, my words must occupy first place or no place at all. Amen. And so I'm saying to you from now on, you need to pay attention to the things that please God. Amen. Inquire of him what he requires of you. And give yourself permission to dethrone and dismiss the fear of men. There are too many people who are afraid of men. And what they go think. And what they go say. Give yourself permission to dismiss that. No, you must be more concerned with what God is going to say about you. What is God going to say? Start giving more attention to the opin God's opinion, the divine opinion. And give yourself permission to dismiss the opinion of men. And as I conclude this morning, I want to remind each and every one of us that we are living in a season of great darkness, of deep darkness that is covering the earth. Nevertheless, Although we are living in that season of darkness, and although we are in the world, we are not of the world. And so because we are not of the world, we have both the ability and the obligation to pierce the darkness with the light that we are carrying. You are bearers of light. And so you have the ability, you have the obligation to pierce the darkness. You say, how can I pierce the darkness? Firstly, by positioning yourself in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of those who are controlled by the darkness, to turn their hearts back to light. You have to go and meet them. 
Go and find them. Go and win them. Go and compel them. Go to them. Secondly, we pierce the darkness by protecting our eyes to ensure that we stay true to the light that is on the inside of us. Thirdly, we pierce the darkness by prioritizing the will of God over the will of men. So three Ps. Position yourself, protect your eyes, and prioritize the will of God over the will of man. The world is waiting. The world is groaning for the manifestation of sons. Those who would arise and shine and dispel the darkness. Shall we bow our heads this morning? Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. Thank you for this word to our hearts and to our hearing. Lord, I thank you that you are raising up a company of believers who will not compromise. A company of believers who will be fearless. A company of believers who will launch themselves out in the midst of the darkness. To counter the darkness with light. Lord, let this word resonate in our hearts and minds. Let this word, Father, give us the courage and the commitment to pierce the darkness. Darkness that surrounds our families. Darkness that surrounds our homes. Darkness that surrounds our workplace. Give us the courage to be that light that will pierce the darkness. And Lord, we are careful always to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Could we stand in the presence of the Lord? Hallelujah. If you are here this morning and darkness is surrounding you, you want us to agree in prayer, to drive back the darkness, come to the front. We're going to pray with you and for you. Brother Paul, I want to sing that song, Here as in Heaven. Here as in Heaven. So we're going to wait on you. We're not going to prolong. You need prayer. You have an issue. You want prayer this morning. Come to the front. The atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere. The atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow, overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Anyone needs prayer this morning, come to the front quickly. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. For 
the Spirit of the Lord is here. Evidence is all around. The evidence is all around. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow. Your 
love certainly surrounds us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, this morning, we have heard from God, and now we want to give back a part of what God has so faithfully given unto us this morning. So this morning, we want to bring in the tithe and the designated offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, we just remember we have two sets of offering. We have the regular tithe and offering, and we also have the seed offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we can come down the middle as you bring in your tithe and your offering this morning. Hallelujah. Every knee 
Jesus is certainly Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to invite Sister Molly, Sister Molly, to come and bless the offering. Hallelujah. 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 Father and God.